One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let's go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, they fell asleep. He fell asleep. Jesus fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were, they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. And there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds, the water, and they obey him? Do you like mysteries? I like mysteries. There are three mysteries in this text that I think are worth looking at. Briefly, Three mysteries surrounding this story. First of all, on March 18th, 1990, 32 years ago, 13 works of art were stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. The 13 paintings were valued at over $100 million, if you can imagine that. Can you put a picture up here for me, Cicero? One of those paintings was this one painted by Rembrandt. The museum guards admitted uh, two men who were posing as police officers into the museum in an odd time of the day, claiming they were responding to a call for disturbance, and they were actually thieves, and they tied up the guards. They looted the museum over the next hours, and the case is still unsolved. By the way, If you like solving mysteries, if you can figure out where the 13 paintings are that include this Rembrandt of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, there's a $10 million reward out there for you. You could be set for the rest of your life. You just have to figure out this mystery. Yes, one of the stolen oil paintings was this famous Flemish artist's classic, painted in 1633. So that's just really a few years after the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. Think about that. A story that is very famous. So that's the first mystery. Where is the painting? Now, the second mystery is about a boat. It's about a boat that was discovered in 1986. Was anybody here born in 1986? Or within it? Were you born in 1986? What year were you born in? 85. Okay, 85. She forgot. All right, so if Jenna here was a year old when in the northern part of Israel, a boat was discovered in the mud flats that were exposed during a time of drought. And that boat found in the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee in Israel had been buried, according to radio or uh, carbon uh, dating, had been buried since the first century, that boat. And it gives us a really clear picture of what the boat might have looked like that the disciples were in at the time when the storm came up on the Sea of Galilee. What's really interesting is that Rembrandt's painting is fairly close to the size of the boat. This boat that was discovered from the first century, and by the way, it was preserved because in the mud, it had not decomposed, and there had been pressure upon the mud somehow. But they believe that boat is about 27 feet long and 7 to 8 feet wide, about 4 and a half feet deep. So the real question is, whose boat was this? I mean, maybe it was Peter's boat. You know, Peter was a fisherman, Peter and Andrew. Maybe it was James and John's boat. Not likely. There were a lot of boats. But maybe it was a boat that actually passed Jesus on the sea. Maybe it was a friend of one of the fishermen there in Copernicus. You know, that's where most of the disciples were from, around the Sea of Galilee. So the mystery is, whose boat was this? 
Did Jesus ever see this boat? Did he ever hitch a ride on this boat? You know, boats are very prominent in the New Testament. Now, finally, here's the third mystery. And by the way, let me say this about the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is not a sea. It's a lake. It's a freshwater lake. It is the lowest lake in the world. The lowest below sea level of any lake in the world. And it is fed by spring water. It's full of fish even to this day. People still fish on the Sea of Galilee. It's about eight miles across. It's extremely deep. And it's surrounded by mountains. It feeds the Jordan River, which makes its way down to the Dead Sea. It's a very prominent area in northern Israel. You hear about the Golan Heights. It's a little bit below that. So the Sea of Galilee is a very prominent place on the, on the, uh, on the map of what we think of today as Palestine, Israel. So what's really interesting about this lake is that it's surrounded by low hills. You'll remember that Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount there around the Sea of Galilee. All of his disciples came from that area. That's why they, people would often say, these are Galileans, because Galilee is quite a ways to the north of Jerusalem. They were considered somewhat less educated up in Galilee. They were rural people. They were from small villages around the lake, most of them from Copernicum, somewhere in that area. But because the, the, the lake is surrounded by hills and because the lake is so deep, this lake can really get wild in a storm. But we're told this particular storm was in incredibly intense. It was a squall. So what a squall is, is that it's not only a storm, but it's, it's winds that are just spinning. I remember at one time being up in northern Minnesota canoeing, and we, we saw these things on the wet water that are often called uh, wind devils. And what they are is it's a, it's a spinning current of, of fog on the water early in the morning or at night, and it's just, it looks like a little tornado just skipping across the water because the winds were just moving in such crazy directions. So imagine how the wind would spin in this very deep region, eight miles across, and how the waves would get moving in the midst of a squall. So my third mystery is this. We're told that Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat when this terrible windstorm comes up. He's sleeping. Now, that's a mystery in itself. How can he sleep in the middle of a storm? He's probably lying upon the nets in the back of the boat. We're told that water's starting to fill the boat. I don't know if Jesus, how wet he's getting. Likely, it's, it's not only water coming in, but it might be raining from up above. Jesus is very tired. He's sleeping. That's quite a thing to think about the fact that when God walked this earth, he slept. But that's not the mystery. The mystery is in his question. We're told that the disciples, and I want you to imagine this for a minute because, you know, we need to imagine New Testament stories to kind of place ourselves in the story and get a real feel of what was going on in the event. So here's my imagination on this story, and my imagination can be somewhat active. So here's the picture of the scene that I would paint. Jesus has been teaching for quite some time. He's tired. Because he's sharing in the human experience, even as we are, he eats, he sleeps, he struggles, he becomes tired. He's had crowds pressing in on him all day, and he says to his disciples, you know, I think it's time to leave this area where all these people are and go to the other side of the sea. We can rest. We'll get rest over there, and we can rest along the way, and everybody's agreeable. So remember, Jesus told them to go out on the sea. Jesus told them to go out where they would encounter a storm. Now, I imagine they don't just pick a boat. I think they probably choose one of their own boats. I mean, I would, wouldn't you? And surely Peter would. Peter loved to kind of be the the head honcho of the disciples, right? He liked to be the guy who was sort of in charge, who asked the question at the right time. He liked to brag a little bit. That's just Peter's nature. So I imagine that we are in Peter's boat. And Peter's thinking to himself, Jesus is in my boat. He picked my boat. Jesus is in my boat. 
great bragging rights. So they set out across the sea. Jesus is quite tired. He goes to the back of the boat, out of the way, and falls fast asleep on the fishing nets. And there in the middle of the sea, the storm arises. Unexpected storms coming up. No weather app, right? John was talking about a storm that came upon them quickly. We have a house that is at the Bryce Resort, and we're right on this side of the mountain range that separates West Virginia and Virginia, and we never know what the weather will be like an hour from now. You never know what's on the other side of the mountain unless you go on the weather app. You look on the weather app, you can see all those funky colors coming at you, and you're like, oh, pretty soon we're going to get rain. And you might not get rain because it might go up the mountain range and then dump a little up further, you know, up on the... uh, up in Maryland, or it might go south, or it might be more coming over there. It might hold behind the mountain, and then all of a sudden come quickly and just dump on you torrential rain. And that's probably the kind of thing that's going on in this event. No weather app in deep waters. You know, storms are not uncommon for fishermen. And we've got four fishermen out of 12 disciples here, four men who are familiar with the sea, in this case, the big lake, And they're tough. They manage on their own. That's what fishermen do. And we also have a couple of accountants accountants in the boat. Think about that. We got Matthew, Levi. We got Judas. They're not exactly guys who are accustomed to being in boats. They're accountants, right? And what do accountants do? They're very practical. They're like, hey, guys, you sure you know what you're doing? Look at Henny over there smiling because he's an accountant. You know, they're safe. They're, they're, they're cautious. They're careful people. Do you guys know what you're doing? Hey, Peter's bragging. John, James, they're like, hey, you can't believe. Let me tell you about the last big storm or the last time we were out on the boat. Are you guys questioning us? And they're just real showing their prowess, showing their skill and telling, just relax, okay? You got to trust us. Besides, we've got Jesus here. Chill. But at some point... Someone yells out, all hands on deck. We're taking on water. We need to start bailing. Hang on. Hang on tight. And everybody looks back at the back of the boat, and there's Jesus. Jesus is fast asleep. He's there. He's powerful. He's already known to do great things. They've seen him do wonderful things. Yet there he is sleeping in the back of the boat. Have you ever been in a situation where you were next to a person who's fast asleep and you're scared to death? I, I think there are times my wife has been awake through the night when I'm fast asleep. I, I sleep like a rock when I sleep. I'll never, I'll come out the next day and the you know, trees will be all over the parking lot or whatever, and I slept right through it. It's, just, it's the way I'm wired. But Becky, she'll, she'll wake up. We're all a little bit different, aren't we? And in this case, all hands on deck, and there's Jesus fast asleep. I don't know about you, but if I'm struggling and someone else is really at peace, that frustrates me. I want you to be as anxious as I am when I'm really anxious. So, you know, it's a crazy kind of thing. In fact, there is a a bond that is formed by people who are full of fear. Have you ever noticed that? If you're full of fear, you can create a bond with other fearful people. If you're full of negativity and you think everything is going to go wrong, you attract people who are the same, and now it feels like the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket, right? It's kind of the way it is. Jesus is sleeping. What is up with that? Can't he sense we are in trouble? We're in desperate trouble. I mean, look at the four fishermen. There is fear in their eyes. Finally, somebody, probably one of the accountants. It's either Judas or Levi. By the way, those are the accountants, Judas and Levi. One of the accountants, one of those practical men, like the lawyers over here, one of the practical men, they get up and say, I don't care what you guys say, I'm waking Jesus up. And they rattle him a little bit. Jesus, Jesus, wake up. 
For crying out loud, we're in trouble. Don't you care that we're seconds away from disaster? We're losing it, Jesus. Come on. What do we do? You're the one who told us to come out here. Jesus stands up. He does the unexpected. It says he rebukes the storm, which he says basically is, if I rebuke you, I say, you stop that right now, Hussein. I rebuke you, right? Just stop it. That's it. No more. That's what Jesus says to the wind and the waves. Now, imagine you're watching this. You know, you're, you're hanging on for dear life. You stop it, storm and wind, and it stops. It's calm. All you can hear is the flopping boat on the water, water sloshing on the sides, and the sea has gone calm. And, of course, Mark tells us this, and Luke actually tells us this, and Matthew tells us this. The disciples who were afraid, now they're scared to death. If I was a cursing man in sermons, I can be once in a while outside of sermons, forgive me, but I would say they were scared, you know what, this. Because it occurred to them. The dude just told the weather to stop, and it stopped. I mean, I'm cool with somebody turning water into wine. I mean, there's something freaky going on here, but turning water into wine, that's not a big deal, really. It's not as big a deal as, like, weatherman stopping the weather. I mean, that's... That's not quite cosmic, but it contains the entire atmosphere, right? There's something going on here that's big. It says they were scared because now they were wondering who was the dude sleeping in the back of the boat that he could do this. But the mystery then is this. The mystery is what on earth does Jesus mean when he says, where's your faith? I mean, come on. He, he, he calms the sea, and then he says, so where's your faith? I know that I would have said, Jesus, what, what are you talking about? Because, well, was he saying this? You should have woke me up sooner. You should have faith that I love you, I care about you, and I can take care of you. You should have just woke me up, but you had no faith. What, you thought I'd get mad because I'm really tired? Is that what was going on? Or was he saying... You guys should relax because you know I'm in the boat with you. And you know, I told you to come out here and I know what's going on. So what's the deal? Where's your faith? Or was he saying, I have faith. And because faith, I can move mountains and I can calm storms. Where's your faith? See, we really don't know. What he meant by that question, and here's what I want to suggest. He could mean all of these things, or it could mean none of them. But this is the way God works. In events in our life that trouble us, that confuse us, God is often saying, come here and wrestle with me for a little bit. Let's just explore this, you and I. So what's going on, guys? We're out here in a boat. We're in the middle of a storm. You're scared to death. You guys thought you were cool because what? You're fishermen? You can handle everything? You guys over here, you were all nervous from the very beginning. What's going on? You see, in our lives, when we go through storms, one of the great questions to ask is, God, what's going on? And God often doesn't answer. Because he's sleeping in the back of the boat. Stay with me for a minute on this. I want you to think about, okay, we're still playing with this is Peter's boat, all right? But instead, let's make it your boat and my boat. He's in our boat, right? And even going a little further with it, take, take this on for a moment. We often talk about our life like being a boat. We're all captains of our own ship. You know, that doesn't really float my boat. You and I, well, we're in the same boat. How are things going? Oh, it's smooth sailing. 
How's things going? My ship is sinking. How's things going? I feel like I'm adrift in life. How are you doing? I'm sailing through life. We use these metaphors all the time of the boat. My ship is finally coming in. Or Jesus is my safe harbor. Right? And we can think of dozens of other expressions that we have. So Jesus is in your boat. You're in the middle of a storm, and he's sleeping. And then when you wake him up, he just asks some confusing question. Where's your faith? I want to ask you, I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Have you ever felt like Jesus is in your boat, but he's fast asleep? You're in the middle of some of the hardest times of your life, and he just seems to be quietly relaxing somewhere in the boat. He's there. The storm is threatening to run over you. And you think to yourself, what good is it to believe in him when he's sleeping in my boat? Where's your faith, Scott? What do you mean, where's my faith? I have you in my boat. I mean, that's where my faith, my faith is in you, but you're sleeping. You're just not there when I need you. You're not answering when I call. Sometimes, Jesus, it feels like I'm doing my part, but you're not doing your part. And you're the one who told me to get into this cotton-picking boat and get out here in the sea. What's up with that? Will you wake up, Jesus? I'm struggling here. Now, I want to bring up a subject I think we all need to consider, and that is, as human beings, we have a tendency toward what I'm going to use the language of psychologists in relationships of codependency. Codependency is when I want you to take responsibility for my life and make it easy on me so I don't have to, like, struggle, address my own problems, be responsible, do the hard work. I just want you to fix my problem. I want you to come to my aid when I want you to come to my aid. I'll probably forget about you an hour later because I haven't grown up a whole lot. Now, stop and think about this. We often have a codependent kind of God that we serve, this idea that God is waiting to be our cosmic bellhop, to just come to us in every situation without saying, what are you going to do about it? You see, there are times that if you really love somebody, you got to let them work it through. You got to let them work through some hard things because that's the only way we really grow up. That's the only way we really come to discover what's important in our lives. That's the only way we really are able to engage the deeper things of life. And so there are times because God loves you and me He sleeps. That doesn't mean he's not in our boat. That doesn't mean he won't work miracles for us. Maybe he will. That doesn't mean that we don't have to activate our own faith in some way and take a a difficult, make a difficult decision that actually is a risk for us. And sometimes you just need to be able to go to him for help and kind of shake the nets a little bit and say, hey, Jesus. And he, he'll, you know, he may just wake up and say, yeah, what can I do for you? But it can go in lots of different ways because 
We have a God who engages us, a God who is relational, a God who wants to be involved in our lives, a God who wants us involved with God, and a God who does not want us to live in a codependency with God. I grew up being told that God controls everything. I grew up being told God is God knows what's going to happen tomorrow, so you just relax. You just. I did not grow up being told that God is like a dance partner. God has a role and I have a role. I did not grow up being told that God was asking me to join God as a co-creator in this world and that I can actually assert some of my own vision and my own dream and God will join with me as I join with God. I grew up being told God has a will for everything in my life. Everything. And in the end, that's fatalism. Kind of removes all responsibility from me. What it really does is it teaches me that God is this dependent. I'm dependent on God for everything. When God actually says, look, I've given you stuff now. I want you to use it. He says, let's grow up. Let's grow up together. All right. I was talking with a friend the other day, and a friend said, I have really been learning how to trust God in practical things in my life. And here's what I've learned. I don't pray the way I used to, that God would give me an open parking spot at the front of the mall parking. I used to do that. I used to pray, God, make life easy for me. God, As I go here, as I go there, just make it happen, Lord. Now, we've been praying the last several weeks that God will give you signs of his presence. God will give you signs of his love. Uh, That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about surprise signs of God's presence and God's love. Not the kind where we're kind of focused only on what I want in life. But, so this person said, I don't don't worry about that anymore. In fact, what I try to do is I go to the mall with a certain kind of joy in my heart. And if there's a parking spot up right in front, I pull in. If somebody else is trying to pull in before me, I'm learning how to let them have that one, and I'll find another one. But they said this. They said, if I find a spot up front, here's what I do. I give thanks to God. Thank you, Lord. How nice this is. If the only spot I can find is way in the back, I say, Lord, thank you for knowing I need my steps. Do you do steps? I do steps. You know, if you, if you commit your life to doing steps, counting your steps, you won't worry about where you park anymore. That's what's cool about doing steps, right? And your car will get less dinged because you can park further out because you're getting steps, you know? Life is about getting steps. I'm aiming someday when I get to heaven, I want God to say to me, I want him to say, you know what, dude? You circled the earth 29 times. It's amazing. No. All right. So then here's the other thing. If there's no parking spot, do you know what I say? you know, I probably shouldn't go shopping today. I'll go shopping tomorrow. Why? Because because God's in my boat. God's in my life. And whether he's sleeping or not, he's in my life. And he's got this, and I can trust him, and I can grow through whatever God has in store for me. Is Jesus in your boat? He's in mine. I thank God he's in my boat. You know how I know he's in my boat? I asked God. I said, Lord, I I need you. Come into my life. I don't care how you do that, when you do that. But to be able to say, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, since the claim is that you're still present in this world after your resurrection through the Holy Spirit, would you just come into my boat? Come into my life. Be in my boat. If you want to sleep in the back, I'm cool with that. If you want to be down in the lower part, I'm cool with that. If you want to be up there pulling up the sail of faith, I'm cool with that. But be in my boat. Be in my life. Is he in your life? Have you trusted him to say, I need you? I mean, you don't have to be in this codependent relationship with somebody to say, I need you in my life. You don't have to need them every moment in your life. There are things you can be responsible for. But Lord, come into my life and help me to grow up in my faith. Secondly, Are you following Jesus' directions? And do you know that sometimes he will direct you right out into the middle of a storm? 
You just, <laughs> he's got his reasons. And part of trusting him is, hey, if I get a parking spot up front, I'm cool. If I do more stuff, it's that kind of settling into the heart of God and saying, Lord, I'm doing your will. I want to do your will today, and I think I'm where you want me to be, and if, if it's chaos and it's difficult here, that's okay. Do not believe the lie that if everything's peaceful and everything's going smoothly, that means God's in it, because that's just not true. Sometimes when you really go with God, it could be extremely painful to do the things God asks you to do, or it could be really rocky and rough. So it just don't live with these kind of ideas that there's some kind of principle out there. This isn't about living by principles. This is about living in relationship with someone. So third, in the midst of your storms, are you open to learning through your storms? Because here's what I find. I learn a lot about myself through storms. Yeah, I learn about God too. I mean, the storm that I shared with my friends over here, one of the big storms in my life, I learned a lot about God through that, but I also learned a lot about myself. I learned how vulnerable I am. I learned how there are things I need to prepare for. There, there are character things that need to go and character things that need to be built into my life. And fourth, am I quick to panic or am I quick to trust? Am I quick to panic or am I quick to trust? See, I don't think the accountants were any worse off than the fishermen here. The fishermen said, we got this. The accountants said, you don't got this. But they were all, in the end, panicking. Am I quick to panic or am I quick to trust? And lastly, do I marvel at the power of God? Do I marvel at the power of God? You see, the great thing about this story is there's a part of this story that exposes who this Jesus is, that he's got this whole thing. He, he's, he's got it. He's in our boat. He's with us. He's got this, and sometimes it feels like he's just sleeping, but it doesn't mean he doesn't have this. He's got this. He could take care of you and me. He wants us to know that. I hope they find that painting someday. I'd sure like to be the one to find it. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, this is just a really cool story. It can go in so many directions, as is the case with all of the scriptures, because through the scriptures, you can do some really incredible things in teaching us by way of your Holy Spirit about really who we are, who you are, what we need, what we don't need, how to grow up in our faith. I just It's incredible that you could... We could have a story that is 2,000 years old here in these pages, and by your Holy Spirit, you could speak that to all of us in a unique way. That's just really amazing. But we know that it was the goal of Luke to tell us that Jesus really is someone very special and that we all need him. So today, Lord, may, may we not forget that, but may we also recognize in the midst of the storm when it feels like you're sleeping, you've still got this. You've still got this. Keep us trusting. May we not live in a spirit of panic, but may we be able to rest with Jesus, knowing he's got this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.